and he says to Fred, Fred, I got bad news for you, Fred. You're fired. I can't continue to employ you here because you help make machines, which my latest phone call just told me we can't sell. And I can't pay you a wage to produce a machine that I can't sell. So I'm really sorry. It's Christmas Eve. Screw you. Go home and cry. That's a violent act. You've just taken away Fred's livelihood. The violence that is done every day in a capitalist system is charmingly opaque to the people who live in a world of fantasy about what a quote-unquote free market means. Hey everybody, welcome to Primo Nutmeg. I'm your host, Steve. On today's show, it's my distinct honor and privilege to have acclaimed Marxist economist Richard Wolff on the show. Richard is the author of Capitalism Hits the Fan, The Global Economic Meltdown and What to Do About It. He also hosts the program Economic Update, and the New York Times Magazine has named him America's most prominent Marxist economist. On the show today, we're going to define what Marxism, socialism, communism, and capitalism mean. We're also going to discuss the varieties of socialism and capitalism, and I'm going to ask him if a coalition between progressives and libertarians is possible. Folks, you aren't going to want to miss one minute of this exclusive interview with Richard Wolff here on Primo Nutmeg. It's a very thoughtful, in-depth analysis of economic systems and political philosophy, so please do stay tuned. However, before we get into that interview, I did just want to make a couple of notes on what's been happening with Primo Nutmeg lately. As many of you know, two weeks ago, Facebook and Twitter launched a sweeping purge against many independent media outlets. These included the Free Thought Project, the Anti-Media, Cop Block, Police the Police, V is for Voluntary, as well as the editors of those outlets. Although this was barely reported by the corporate media, it did reflect a sweeping attack on the actual free press in the United States, namely the anti-corporate, anti-war, anti-duopoly, alternative press. Although Primo Nutmeg was not swept up in that purge, we have been the victim of censorship, namely at the hands of YouTube, who has kept us demonetized for eight straight months with no explanation. We are being held in permanent review, despite having zero community strikes and zero copyright violations. In response to the Facebook and Twitter purge, Primo Nutmeg opened up an account at Minds.com. Minds.com is one of those alternative media outlets where content creators are going now that they're being censored on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. As such, folks, I urge you to open an account at Minds.com as well as other alternative social media platforms. Tell your friends about these different sites. As the crackdown on free speech continues on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, it's going to reach a point where you're only going to be able to find alternative voices on alternative social media platforms. So join us on Minds.com and also help us keep in contact with you by going to PrimoNutmeg.com and signing up for the mailing list right at the top of the screen. This way, after the next purge, we'll be able to reach you. And lastly, folks, as always, please do go to Patreon.com slash PrimoNutmeg. Again, because we've been demonetized by YouTube for eight months, we really need all the support that we can get, helping us bring you more interviews with the likes of Noam Chomsky, Jill Stein, Ralph Nader, Ron Paul, Cynthia McKinney, Stephanie Kelton, Matt Taibbi, Abby Martin, Richard Wolf, and so many others. Thank you again, folks, for all of the support. We are growing this independent media outlet with your help. Now, without any further ado, here's my interview with Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, welcome to Primo Nutmeg. Glad to be here. Yeah, you know, this is a real honor for me. I have uh, seen you and heard you speak for many years. You are a prominent economist. You are a very prominent Marxist economist. And I guess that's where I'd like to maybe start off because, you know, when we talk about politics and we talk about economics, a major part of it is these labels. How would you define the terms Marxist, socialist, and communist? Do you embrace those terms, or do you think that maybe they're antiquated? Just overall, what, what's your thoughts on those labels? Well, the problem is neither that they're vague, they aren't, or that they're antiquated. I don't think so either. The problem with the labels is that they mean different things to different people, and you always get into difficulty 
when uh, any two people use the same word, but turn out to mean something very different. Even common words. Take the word love. If you're a young man or woman and uh, you use that word with another young man or woman, you better be very careful to figure out whether you both mean the same thing when you use the word, either one of you to the other one, because if you mean different things, all kinds of consequences, good and bad, can flow. That doesn't mean you don't use the word love. It means you have to, if you're aware of your surroundings, pay some attention to the fact that different people mean different things. So let me explain at least what I mean by terms like Marxism, socialism, communism, so forth. And the way to do that, like with most interesting questions, is to look at the history. Capitalism, which is the system that socialists, communists, and Marxists react to, starts around the 17th and 18th century in England. Before that, there had been little episodes, you might say, of capitalism, but until the 18th century in England, it didn't really become the dominant prevailing system. Across Europe, for example, for the previous thousand years, a system called feudalism had been the dominant system. But once it catches hold and kind of becomes dominant in England, it spreads from there to the rest of Europe and from there to the rest of the world, so that we today live in a global system that is predominantly capitalist. And when that transition happened in the 17th and 18th century, the transition from the feudalism that had existed before to the capitalism that replaced it, uh, we had a number of kind of revolutionary breakthroughs. Some of them were in the realm of thought. People like Adam Smith and David Ricardo founded uh, modern economics, and they did so at the time when capitalism was coming into its dominant period, and they were boosters. They were enthusiasts. They thought capitalism was great. They weren't, by the way, uncritical. They had critical things to say, but by and large, they thought that capitalism was an enormous advance for the human race, and they celebrated it. Every economic system has had people who celebrate it. That's part of the, of the way things work. But it's equally true that every system has also produced, sooner or later, and it's usually sooner, people who are critical. And uh, Smith and Ricardo, who wrote at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, were followed by roughly by 50 years by another thinker, Karl Marx, who um, was a close student of Smith and Ricardo. He left writings showing how closely he had read all of their work and how praiseful he was of what he had learned from Smith and Ricardo. Uh, so he hel it helped him understand capitalism, which he was interested in doing. But he came to a different conclusion, and that's partly because it was 50 years later. They were at the beginning of capitalism's dominance, whereas Marx, coming 50 years later, reached his intellectual maturity at a time when capitalism was pretty well settled, the middle of the 19th century. It's a kind of time when capitalism is the dominant system. But here's the problem. In the enthusiasm of, of overthrowing feudalism and bringing in capitalism that was celebrated by Adam Smith and celebrated by David Ricardo, there were also some heady political transformations, the most famous of which were the French Revolution in 1789 and the American Revolution a few years before that. And those revolutions, which were against feudalism, the French overthrew and destroyed French feudalism, and the United States broke away from the British feudalisms of King George III uh, to set up a capitalist economy here, which is what the French did there. And the enthusiasm of the people who made these revolutions took the following form. We are going to institute capitalism because... Capitalism will bring with it liberty, equality, fraternity. By the way, those were the three slogans of the French Revolution. And democracy, which was the slogan of the American Revolution. In other words, the enthusiasts and the proponents of capitalism loved it, not only because it was a better economic system, they certainly believed that, but also because it would bring, again, liberty, equality, fraternity, brotherhood, and democracy. Coming 50 years later, basically, Marx looks around, says, okay, we certainly got capitalism, it's everywhere around us and growing. But when it comes to liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, 
we don't have it. In Marx's judgment, capitalism had betrayed its own promises. Capitalism had failed to deliver the liberty, equality, and democracy, and brotherhood it had promised. And for Marx, this was not something he needed to show. Uh, if you read any, any novel by Charles Dickens, you'll see it within the first 10 pages. Uh, so he took that as obvious. So he set himself the task of explaining what happened. He loved the slogans of liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. He endorsed them wholeheartedly all his life. But he wanted to explain what was it that blocked or proved to be the obstacle that capitalism couldn't overcome, which explains why it couldn't deliver what it had promised in the way of liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. And the conclusion he reached required him to become a very close student of capitalism, which he was, to write up his analysis of capitalism, which he did, and to use that analysis to reach the conclusion. And the conclusion was that capitalism failed to achieve what it had promised because inside capitalism itself are unavoidable obstacles. The problems for capitalism were not external to it. It didn't fail to deliver on its promises because somebody else or some force outside of itself intervened. Capitalism was unable to realize those promises because inside capitalism are the mechanisms that prevent liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy from ever being realized. So Marx becomes the critic. Now, he's just writing in London, where he spent most of his adult life, writing all this out, if, if that's at the end of the story, we wouldn't be talking about it now. But it wasn't. Marx's work got picked up by all kinds of other people who weren't happy with how capitalism was evolving. It turns out that there were millions and millions of those people. They formed trade unions because they were dissatisfied with the wages capitalism paid. They formed political parties because they were dissatisfied with the politics that capitalism organized. And they turned to Marx as the theorist, as the writer, as the person who had written down to express what was wrong with capitalism. And they used that to kind of inform their strategies as trade unions, their strategies as political parties. And the name they took, and this is for historical reasons, was socialism. Throughout the entire 19th century, the movement that was critical of capitalism, it had a number of different names, but the name that became dominant was socialism. And the thinker associated with that who became dominant, he wasn't the only one, but his work became dominant, was Marxism. So in the 19th century, you would basically say socialism was the major movement of criticism against capitalism. It was a, a set of people and activities who believed fundamentally that the human race could organize itself better than capitalism did, and they thought they could do that. And the theorists they used to make their cases was the work of Karl Marx. And over the 19th century, and even more in the 20th, Marxism and socialism spread from its origins in Europe to every corner of the world. In fact, it's one of the most startlingly successful global movements in the history of the human race. However, until 1917, Marxism as a theory and socialism as a political movement were critical of capitalism, but had not yet achieved political power. At the end of World War I in 1917, 1918, one country on the planet, namely Russia, which had lost World War I, it was on the losing side of that war, and sub subsequently thrown into a lot of suffering and chaos because of that. A lot of the World War I was fought on Russian soil. The destruction was cataclysmic. In the aftermath of losing that war, a revolution broke out in Russia against capitalism. And it was led by self-conscious Marxists, people who had studied the Marxist literature, who are part of the global socialist movement. And they 
one, they took over the government in a revolution in 1917. There immediately broke out in Russia a, a civil war between those who liked the revolution and those who hated it. The civil war lasted from 1918 to 1922. In the end, it pitted the Red Army, they liked the revolution, against the White Army, which didn't. The Red Army won, and the White Army lost. The White Army lost despite the intervention of four countries who sent troops to work with the White Army to overthrow the revolution. I mention this now because American history taught in America leaves little details like this out. The four countries that sent troops were Japan, France, Britain, and the United States. That's right. The United States sent troops to put down the Soviet Revolution. The Soviet Union never sent troops to the United States to do anything. Who has the right to be afraid of whom? Always struck me as a funny kind of argument for Americans to make. In any case, with the Russian Revolution in 1917, socialists and Marxists around the world were confronted with something new. For the first time, some of them had actually won political power. They had pulled off a revolution, and despite bad odds, they had prevailed. When the dust cleared and the last foreign soldier left and the Civil War was over, the socialists, led by a man named Lenin, were in charge. They had won, and they were now the new government of the country that renamed itself the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And all socialists around the world kind of had a problem. Did they like this? Did they like what they saw going on in Russia? Were they to line up behind the Russians because they said these guys must know what they're doing because they won? Or were they critics? And just like capitalism has always had the people who love it and the people who, cr who criticize it, the Soviet Union, from the day it began, had the people who love it and the people who were critical of it, but who were all socialists. They just some of them thought that what the Russians were doing was spot on, and the others thought it was a big mistake. And so the socialist movement split. Half of them became admirers and followers of the Soviet Union, and the other half held on to their socialism. They didn't want capitalism, but they didn't think that the Soviet Union was the way to go. And the ones who decided to follow the Soviet Union decided not only to split from the others, but to change their names. And they took the name communist. That's when the communist parties of the world began in 1919, 1920, 1921. So for me, watching and looking at all of this, I would say to people today that the single most powerful tendency or the single most powerful body of critical literature of capitalism is Marxism. It's not the only criticism of capitalism, not at all. But in terms of its influence, in terms of the number of people across the world who've contributed to it, developed it, it is the biggest tradition. But of course, any tradition that spreads in 150 years across every country and culture of Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, and so on, it's going to be interpreted in many different ways. That's why if you talk about Marxism, you cannot talk about it in the singular because to talk about Marxism in the singular means you either don't understand that there are radically different interpretations, or you don't want the person you're talking to to understand it, and neither of those positions is justified. So, for example, the Soviet Union was a supporter of a particular interpretation of Marxism that lots of other Marxists did not agree with. If you're going to talk about Marxism, you have to distinguish the Soviet version, which was taken up by the communist parties, from the non-Soviet versions in the plural that were taken up either by just groups of intellectuals or maybe some political parties or maybe even some other governments. But you can't act as if it were all the same. One of the most illegitimate moves, which is made just the other day by this fellow from Canada, Jordan Peterson. He makes a very classical move, which is totally, I mean, it's illegitimate, illogical. He denounces Marxism 
because of bad things that happened in Russia. Now, there's no doubt bad things happened in Russia. No one's going to argue with him about that. But that's really got very little to do with a critique of Marxism, because Marxism is many other things, including bodies of thought very critical of what happened in Russia, critical long before Mr. Jordan Peterson ever figured it out. And all of that is ignored. It's as if I said to you, you should dismiss Christianity because the Catholic Church had an inquisition back 500 years ago that was really awful, or that Christians massacred the Native American population here in the United States in order to take the land away from them, or there was a Holocaust against Jews and gays and gypsies conducted by a Christian German society. Yes, those things happened, and yes, they were done by Christians. But that's not an argument to reject Christianity because it's reducing Christianity to these horrible examples, and it's no more legitimate to do that to Marxism. It's actually funny that uh, you say that, because I've actually used that analogy during Bernie Sanders' campaign when I said to a Christian, you know, you can't just say he's a socialist and all socialists are bad because there's different kinds of socialism, like there's different kinds of Christianity. You can't say right. that a Catholic is a Calvinist, is a Jehovah's Witness, and, and so on. Right. Um, Stupid. It, it, there's a kind of ignorance there, but that's sort of willful. I mean, anyone, literally anyone who spends an afternoon in a decent library, if you study the Soviet Union, you study from the beginning all the criticisms of it. You know, the first 10 years of, of Soviet Union were a tremendous battle after Lenin died between Stalin and a fellow named Trotsky. It split the global socialist movement again. Trotsky was a bitter critic of Stalin who wrote voluminously, had followers in virtually every country of the world. But to act as though socialism is always what Stalin did in the 15, 20 years he ran that country. I mean, it, it, it's grotesque. Socialism is what the people in Denmark think they're doing. It's what the people in large parts of Germany and France think of themselves, of Latin America, of Asian countries. It's so childish that it begins to be suspect that this is an attempt simply to smear. You know, for me, I've tried, for example, I teach courses in Christianity. If I taught a course in which what I was really teaching was, I don't know, uh, Lutheranism, my obligation is to teach the students this is one branch of Christianity. It's the Lutheran branch, but it's not Greek Orthodox, and it's not, as you put it, Jehovah Witness or Mormons or any one of a thousand others. And you have the same obligation if you're talking about Marxism, unless you're really not doing that. You're just demonizing, and so you're using a kind of cheap shot that ought to be ruled out of order. It's as if instead of having an argument, you start throwing rocks. So I do see this as a failing on the right, is that they can't really properly distinguish among these different kinds of socialism or Marxism. I have to also say, though, that I think that there's a corresponding failure on the left, because obviously when you talk about capitalism and the proponents of capitalism, there's a lot of different kinds, right? I mean, you have the uh, Republican Party in the U.S., you have liberal Democrats, you have the Ayn Rand folks, you have the Chicago School, you have anarcho-capitalists like Murray Rothbard and Walter Block. I find it problematic to kind of use these terms because we're talking about such big ideas and such diverse arrays of thought that I almost think it would be better just to do away with these terms entirely and, and just talk in concretes. Do you think that that's fair, or do you think that these words do serve a purpose? No, I think I think that's going you know, the pendulum swinging a little bit far the other way. I think it's perfect. I understand what you're saying, and I think you you you're right to say one needs to distinguish in any kind of sustained conversation the differences that exist there. And I think you know we have to do that if we're on, I'm on the left, so I have to do it when I talk about the right, uh, just as much as I demand they do it with us. But it is not illegitimate to ask questions about whether all socialists agree on some things. Is there something we can point to that all socialists, no matter what their differences, agree on? And likewise, is there something that all the strains on the right agree, or at least most of them agree on, that we can point to? 
which is not to obliterate their differences, but it's likewise not to obliterate what might be held in common. So, for example, among socialists, when I look for something that's in common, I have a very, very hard time doing that. Given the oppression that socialists have had to live under in most of the countries of the world for most of the last century and a half, it's probably not surprising that they have morphed into an immense array of different things, but they do not, to me, have a common core. Let me, let me be very concrete and explain that. For many socialists, including Bernie Sanders and folks like that, their focus is what we might call macroeconomic. They are interested in who owns things. They'd like to see less private ownership of the means of production and more socialized or nationalized ownership. And likewise, they'd like to see a little less reliance on the market and a bit more on government planning. They want to encumber the market with all kinds of regulations. They want to help people have a better life than an unregulated, ungovernmental, interfering capitalism would give them. That's why they want a minimum wage. That's why they want national health care. That's why they like rent control. They want a capitalism, in my judgment. They want the enterprise to continue to run pretty much the way it has but to be subject to rules and regulations and limits that will make for a kinder, gentler, more supportive society than would be the case if you didn't have those rules and regulations. They go further than the Liberal Democrats because the Liberal Democrats want some regulation, but the Democratic Socialists want a good bit more of that kind of regulation. And they call that socialism. Well, for many of us, uh, I'm not part of that. For many of us, this is all well and good. I, I, I'm happy they're doing that. But my criticism goes much further than that. My criticism goes at the micro level, and it goes into the enterprise itself. For me, the heart, the core of capitalism, which I am a critic of, has to do with the way you organize the production of goods and services. That's what the economy is. It's how you organize the production and distribution of services. In a capitalist economy, you organize that through a dichotomy of employer on one side and employee on the other. The employee comes to work five out of seven days of the week and does what he or she is told. They sit or stand where they're told. They work with machines and equipment in a way that they are told to do, in a physical location that they are told to stay in. They have absolutely nothing to say about any of that. It is a dictatorship. And when they end the day, finishing having poured their brains and muscles into producing goods and services, they are told to go home and to come back the next day and do it all again. The fruits of their labor, as soon as they are produced, belong to somebody else who didn't produce them at all. And that is the person, the board of directors in a modern corporation would be those people. Board of directors is usually 15 to 20 people, and the, corporate, and the workers are 500 or 5,000 or 500,000, depending on the size of the company. In short, a tiny group of people have dictatorial non-accountable power over a majority. The capitalist workplace is a fundamentally anti-democratic institution. That's what's wrong with it. Because a tiny number of people control capitalism workplaces, they make sure to take the bulk of whatever is produced there beyond what has to be given back to workers so they can eat and sleep and reproduce, they take the bulk of what Marx called the surplus and enrich themselves with it, which explains why capitalism could never deliver the equality it promised at its origins, because the structure of production 
guarantees a minority will assemble the wealth and accumulate it, and the mass of people won't. For me, capitalism is the problem. And the solution would be the end of the dichotomy between employer and employee. It would be the transformation of a capitalist enterprise into a democratic enterprise, or what is often called a worker co-op, in which all the people involved in the enterprise, one person, one vote, make the decisions democratically, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits that, after all, all of the workers helped to generate by their activities. For me, the critique of capitalism that I learned from Marx is about what I just said. It's about a transformation at the base of society, in the place where we produce the goods and services everybody depends on, the enterprise. And unless you deal with that, you are decorating capitalism. You're making it more humane, perhaps. You're making it more socially fair. You can use all kinds of language, but you're not doing the critique of what capitalism is that Marx taught. And that's okay. You don't have to be a Marxist or that's your business or anyone's business. But if you're going to take the, the critique seriously, that's where it goes. And if you're not going to take it seriously, if you're going to disagree with Marx, well, you've got to deal with this stuff rather than to pretend it's not there. You have not exhausted socialism, and you certainly have missed Marxism, if you stay at the level of governmental intervention in the economy. I have taught Marxian economics all my adult life. For those who are not familiar, let me make it real clear. Marx never wrote about socialism. Marx didn't write much about the state either. He was interested in how the capitalist system works, how each enterprise functions, and how the system, that is the interaction of enterprises, both with one another and with the working public and consuming public, how that system works. And when he reached his conclusion, he said it works in a way that prevents liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, and that if you want those things, which Marx does, and which I think most Americans do, well, then you've got a big fat problem. You've got an economic system that stands in contradiction to the values you claim to endorse and uphold, which means if you really want to eradicate, let's say, poverty, then you've got to deal with the Marxist argument that being an enemy of poverty makes you an enemy of capitalism or else you're not serious. The Marxists have always enjoyed, in a way, the irony that capitalism every few years has a war on poverty. And it has to do that every few years because it never wins that war. It's a little bit like the war on drugs. You can't possibly believe that the war on drugs is for real since it's been going on for 50 years and drugs are more available now than they ever were. Something is wrong and you can pretend it's this or that detail, but the Marxist argument is it's not a detail, it's the core structure of that. And so I've, I've illustrated, I hope, that there are socialists for whom everything I just said about the enterprise is of no interest. They're socialists because they want free colleges and they want Medicare for all, and that's what they mean. And they're fully entitled to that perspective. Nobody owns the word socialism. Nobody owns the word communism or anything else, uh, but, but it does impose on the rest of us an awareness that these words mean different things to different people and that these differences matter. So the critique of socialism that I've heard among self-described capitalists is that socialism is force, whether it's through the state and the state getting involved and in doing you know, regulations and creating laws, or if it's the workers seizing the means of production, 
that these are inherently violent acts and that in a true free market, a true capitalist, voluntarist society, you wouldn't have the threat of violence and anybody could be free to do anything. So you would have the choice to go work for an employee in a dictatorial business or you'd be free to set up a worker co-op and people would be free to join. So what would be your counter to that, to the capitalists who say, listen, we just want a free society. We just want a voluntary society, a pacifist society where violence is not being applied. And you folks are the ones who want the application of force. Yeah, I find, you know, I find that virtually stupefying. But, you know, let me try to overcome my response to this as best I can. Again, let's start with the history. Capitalism, Marx once wrote, comes into this world dripping blood from every pore. The French Revolution was a violent revolution. Traditional societies, pre-capitalist societies in every corner of the world were assaulted by capitalists coming from the more capitalist developed world and imposing the capitalist system on them whether the British and arriving in India or the Europeans arriving in what we now call North America or any of the other examples of colonialism and imperialism. I mean, the, the notion that capitalism has something to do with peace or peacefulness uh, blows my mind. The world has had two world wars, two cataclysms of immense destructiveness unlike the world has ever seen before. Those were struggles among capitalist countries, chiefly uh, Britain and Germany, and then others were drawn into it, competing with one another for colonies, for global positioning in a world market. The level of slaughter that the capitalist system has brought with it takes your breath away. You know, when I hear the critiques of the awful things Stalin did, it's usually coming from the mouths of people who have a blithful ignorance that they're not in a really good position to make this argument because it's going to bounce back and bite them in the rear end, number one. Number two, in capitalism itself, violence is always either threatened or imposed. Let me just give you two or three casual examples. In a capitalist free enterprise system of the sort you just referred to, let me, let's me let use a exa hypothetical example. A group of capitalists are running a small company in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and they make the decision, which they're supposed to, they're the owner operators of a factory, that things are not looking too good for, let's say they produce, oh, rubber shoes, and the rubber shoe market is looking a little slow. And so they make the decision that whereas they had last year bought the machines to replace those that are worn out and the year before, that this year they're not going to replace the old machines with new and expensive ones because they don't think the new and expensive ones, which only work if you produce more shoes, that they can sell those shoes. And it makes no sense to use the profits they earned last year to expand their machines if they won't be able to sell the extra output. Typical decision businesses make all the while. So they decide not to plow their profits back into the business, hold on, wait six months or a year, see what the market looks like then, and if it looks better, well, they'll go in. Okay, this is a decision they're free to make, and indeed, they're hired to make that. That's their job as the owner-operators of a private capitalist enterprise. Now, let's trace through the results. By deciding not to buy the machine that they had originally thought they would, they have to make a phone call. And call to the company they usually buy machines from, located in Brooklyn, New York, and they say, because they know the friend there, friend Al there, hey, Al, uh, we got to tell you, we're not going to be ordering the machine that we normally order from you at this time. And he, explaining why the, the market doesn't look so good for us. And so it's wiser for us not to do so. Al, who's in this uh, business, understands these things, says that he's sorry to hear it, of course, but he understands. Then Al hangs up. Al then calls in my cousin Fred, 
and he says to Fred, Fred, I got bad news for you, Fred. You're fired. I can't continue to employ you here because you help make machines, which my latest phone call just told me we can't sell. And I can't pay you a wage to produce a machine that I can't sell. So I'm really sorry. It's Christmas Eve. Screw you. Go home and cry. That's a violent act. You've just taken away Fred's livelihood. The fact that the folks in Kenosha, Wisconsin, didn't know this, didn't uh, intend any harm, that's really not very interesting to Fred or his wife and six children, is it? The violence that is done every day in a capitalist system is charmingly opaque to the people who live in a world of fantasy about what a quote-unquote free market means. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with the uh, political compass, but I'm interested in it too because it seems like, you know, we're always kind of having this left-right debate, this socialism-capitalism debate, and it seems like what should be equally or perhaps even more important is the top-down debate the debate between the uh, amount of government and government force that's applied. I know that you pointed to the Soviet Union, you know, obviously applying too much and being a despotic uh, regime right. and not representing what you believe in. And then, you know, also, I mean, you, you have a whole plethora of libertarian in the classic sense of the word, meaning left wing and right wing, you know, anarchist in, in both the uh, Kropotkin, Bakunin, uh, Proudhon sense as well as, you know, the, the more modern ver variations of that, like Maury Rothbard. So I just right. kind of wonder, shouldn't we also be focusing, if not equally, perhaps even more so, on how much government we have? And uh, along with that, in a freer society, in a voluntary, less status society, wouldn't we be free to try different economic systems? Wouldn't maybe this village or town be free to be mutualist? And this town be free to be communist, and this town be free to be anarcho-capitalist. Shouldn't that also be something that we should be focusing on or um, just at least thinking about? Well, I mean, as someone who's a Democrat with a little D for me, absolutely on the last point, I also think that's how things are going to work. I think you're going to see more and more worker co-ops, democratized enterprises in the world, and they're going to function, and they're going to challenge capitalist system. In, in a number of countries, they already do. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the seventh largest corporation in Spain is a co-op. It's a worker co-op called the Mondragon right. Corporation. It's very famous. If you go to Italy, you go to the province of Emilia-Romagna, a major part of Italy, 40% of the economy of that region of Italy is worker co-ops. And they've been existing there for decades, and, and they are a solid part. No politician would dare, right or left winger, touch them. It would mean the immediate end of that politician's career. And, and co-ops are forming in the United States literally every day now because it's becoming interesting to people as the capitalist system becomes more uninteresting to them or even oppressive. So I, I, you know, the notion of having a democratic decision made, say, here in the United States, town by town or region by region or state by however it's to be done. I like that. That, that smells and tastes good to me. I think that would be a democratic decision about what economic organization you want, and that's exactly what we should have. However, I'm not naive. If you're going to say to the American people, for example, let's vote in some way, do you want 50-50, capitalist, non-capitalist? Do you want 100% one, 100% the other, one-third, one-third, one, I mean, whatever you want. In order for that to be what we used to call an informed decision, then people have to know what the options are. In the United States, it is systematically kept from the mass of people what those options are. If you, I've done this a hundred times in my classes in various universities, raise my hand and ask people to explain to me the difference between a capitalist enterprise and a worker co-op. And if 10% of the students even know what the words mean, mm. it's a good day. Yeah. So we don't have that. The only way you're going to get an informed 
population is if you create, as an act of political will, significant segments of your economy where people can work from whom they can buy and they can watch and hear their friends and relatives talk about what it's like to work in such an environment. Then there would be the knowledge based on real experience that would allow and inform the public to make some sort of decision. Here in the United States, where the very word socialism is demonized, and where, I just to give you an example, 99% of business schools don't have a course in how to organize a worker co-op. Sure. The, only, the only structure anyone learns is the structure of capitalism as if it were the only imaginable way of doing business, which it's never been, but that's the ideology, particularly here in the United States. By the way, it's very different. You go to England or Germany or Sweden, there are all kinds of courses in all kinds of institutions about worker co-ops because there's loads of them. It's just, you know, it has nothing to do with the United States except the narrowness of the ideological uh, spectrum here. So, yeah, yes, I'd be glad to have democratic choice among them, but it would have to be with the precondition that we actually set up such a, a significant sector of the economy so people know what they're choosing. By the way, there is an important political movement in the world that's doing exactly what I just said, and it's in the strange and unusual country known as the United Kingdom, Britain. The second most important political party in Britain is the Labour Party. Current polling in England indicates that if there were an election now, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the head of the Labour Party, would become the prime minister. This is interesting because the official position of the Labour Party is as follows. If they win the election, and therefore they have the majority in the British Parliament, they will pass a law. And the law reads as follows. Any business in England can continue to function the way it is. But... If it decides, the people who own and operate it now, if they decide either to close the business or to move it to another part of the world or to sell it to yet another business or to go public, that is to issue shares, they are required, this law will require them to offer their own employees something called the right of first refusal. In other words, they can't take any step to fundamentally alter that business without first giving their own workers the opportunity to buy out the owners of the business and convert it into a worker-owned, worker-run cooperative. And when this is explained to people, the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. John McDonald, who works with Corbyn, is asked, well, where in the hell are the workers ever going to get the money? He smiles and says, the government is going to lend it to them. Okay, that's a commitment by a major political party to create a worker co-op sector of the British economy. Using government money to finance these uh, worker co-ops so that the British people will have knowledge of and experience with and understanding about worker co-ops and then be able to make an informed democratic choice as to what kind of economic system they want, which, which, which kinds of enterprises, et cetera, et cetera. Here in the United States, the level of backwardness is such that what I've just told you is not known the story isn't put in the newspaper. The fact that the United States can't even imagine these things except in tiny corners, it's a sad sign about the cost to the United States of the last 50 years of demonizing because of the Cold War, everything on the left. So none of these kinds of thoughts, none of these kinds of realities, none of these kinds of political initiatives are even known about, let alone discussed and debated. Right. And, you know, when you look at the Cold War, for example, I think that, you know, the, the U.S. and the Soviet Union posed themselves as supposed to be opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think that it was very beneficial for, obviously, the politicians in both countries, the weapons manufacturers, the elites in both societies. And it seems like at a certain point, whether it's the market taking over the government or the government taking over the market, 
there is inevitably an elite that dominates society through the force of government. So shouldn't there really be a coalition? Shouldn't there be a coalition that transcends this economic spectrum, these ideological labels of communist or socialist and capitalist, and people who would want to work together to have a free society where people are free to experiment with different forms of economic cooperation and association. And there's, I think there's a lot of agreement, for example, between libertarians and progressives or greens or socialists on things like ending domestic spying, ending the drug war, bringing the troops home. So shouldn't there pragmatically really be cooperation between capitalists and socialists on limiting these objectively wrong things that government does? Sure. I mean, it's a lovely idea. The problem is how you could imagine such a thing happening. From those of us on the left, the problem is clear for us. The problem is capitalism. If you organize all of the enterprises of a country in a top-down hierarchical way, remember what that means. Every business is run by a tiny group of unaccountable people at the top. It is a dictatorship. If you don't please the people at the top, you're fired. 10% of American workers today are represented by a union. The union maybe will be able to protect them from being fired. A lot of times it can. But for 90% of American employees, they have no union. And consequently, they work at the pleasure of their employer. Yes, there are a few laws limiting what they can be fired for, but it's a childish, easy to get around them. Everybody knows that, et cetera, et cetera. You have a dictatorship which is drilled into every working person's consciousness all day, every day that they're at work. It's going to be very difficult for those people to imagine any other way of organizing society. It's going to be very difficult for them to sustain an interest in that. Half of the reason most Americans don't care about politics, half of us don't vote anyway, is because we have been trained over and over again in our work life that we don't count. All the key decisions are made by people in another place, in another room, wearing different outfits whose names we don't even know. And suddenly we're supposed to get real interested in the details of our town, of, of our state. Of course, the majority of people don't do that. If you want people to participate politically, you've got to let them participate at the workplace, which is where adults spend most of their lives. Five out of seven days, the best hours of those days, they're friggin' at work. And if you train them at work that they don't count that they're who do what they're told, who have no role whatsoever in running the place, designing the place, making the decisions and the things about how the community of people in that workplace function, if all of that they're excluded from, then to expect them suddenly to want to be included in the political is naive and childish. You're not going to get any of this. You're not going to get you know, a freedom of everybody to do what they want. This notion of freedom, that has to be taught just like everything else has to be taught. But we don't teach that in our society. We never have. We teach obedience. Our schools are set up that the, you do an exercise and the teacher tells you whether you're right or wrong. The notion that you might have seen it in a different way, that your intelligence works in a way different from other people's, and that maybe that should be explored. 90% of our teachers have no fucking idea about such things. And that's not because it's bad teachers. It's because it's not the way the society works. The demand of, of socialism has always been the same one that we used to address to kings. Kings and queens and emperors used to tell the rest of us, you need me. I either intercede with God on your behalf, so you better not mess around with me, or else I'm a person of such wisdom, of such sagacity, or to use the modern form, I have so many wonderful advisors. You need me to make the decision because you, schmuck, are not capable of doing it. We had to overthrow kings. We had to get rid of monarchy in order to make this amazing experiment 
Suppose we don't have a king. Suppose we don't have a queen or an emperor or a czar or any of it. Suppose we actually just elect people on a rotating basis and run the system self-government of the people. What a revolutionary idea. The kings assured us that if we ever did such a thing, society would fall apart. It didn't. All I'm saying, and all the real critique of Marxism is, cut the crap about how every business has run by a king or a queen or a board of directors, which is a collection of kings and queens. We can run it ourselves. And if and when you give the mass of people the chance to run the economy, that will be the first time it's run for the people instead of a small minority. And that will train people when they have to make the decisions of how to run a business that they ought to be making the same decisions about how to run the residential part of their lives in the communities where they live because they will be trained in the appetite for it and they will be trained in the mechanisms of doing it. That's the only way you're going to get this. Otherwise, you're going to have this conversation, the one you and I are having, this year, last year, and 10 years from now about how it would be really nice if we just did the kinds of things. And my argument is the precondition for that nice thing to happen is the end of capitalism. And if you don't, if you don't do that, then, you, you know, in a sense, you have yourself to blame for finding it so difficult to make the other kinds of changes. Well, Dr. Wolf, I really do appreciate you uh, coming on okay. Primo Nutmeg today. You know, af after an hour, I think that we're still just scratching the surface, so I'd love to have of you back course. on at some point in the future. But for folks out there who are intrigued by what you say and would like to learn more about you and your work, where can they go to do that? Very, very easy. You go to the website, Democracy at Work, that's all one word, Democracy at Work dot info, I N F O. And the only other thing I would suggest is that you take a look at our weekly radio and television program. It's a half hour program. It's on all over the United States. The name of the program is Economic Update. It's a weekly commentary on what's happening. And you can get it on YouTube. Just go to YouTube Economic Update. You'll find it. And if you want to be even more regularly involved, Go to our Patreon page. It's very simple. You go to the website Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash economic update. Again, that's the name of our program. Well, again, Richard Wolf, thank you very much for being on the show today. I really do appreciate your time. Again, I feel like we just scratched the surface, so hopefully we can have you back we'll on do the it show. Again. Absolutely. Absolutely.